But I'd just like to speak to us about the sheep and the goats. And something that's very, very important. Uh, it's very important for you and I to make sure that we are sheep and not goats. Because this is the warning and this is something we need to worry about is that inside of the church, there are sheep and there are goats. I'm not even talking about in the world, I'm talking about in the church. In the church, there are sheep and there are goats. Amen. But let's have a look at this and look at where it comes from. It's written in Matthew chapter 25. Verse 31 to 34, you see it there, but it reads the following. This is when the judgment comes. This is from the book of, this is actually speaking, Jesus is speaking about something that we see occurring in the uh, the book of Revelations as well. And Jesus is speaking prophetically about the end times. And Jesus is speaking and he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Listen to what it says here. All the nations will be gathered before him. All the people that ever were will be gathered before Him. All the nations, all people will be gathered before Him. And He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right hand and the goats on His left hand. Then the King will say to those on His right hand, who's on the right hand? The sheep. Come you who are blessed by my Father and take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And we know the scripture goes further and it says that those that are on his left hand. He says you are cursed. And he cast them out into out, out of darkness and into fire and into brimstone. Amen. You now what's interesting for me about this. Who's ever heard of, of Wicca or Wiccan? What they call white magic. Have you guys ever heard of that? Do you know what they call themselves? They call themselves the left hand path. They call themselves the left hand path. And it's amazing for me because here Jesus separates and he puts the sheep on the right hand. And he puts the goats on the left hand side. And the left get cast away. And the right hand get taken into his presence. Amen. When you look at the difference between sheep and goats. The difference between sheep and goats actually appears in the pattern of Easter that we're going into now. The pattern of a true conversion, in other words, a real sheep and a real believer and a real child of the Lord Jesus Christ. The pattern of that, to be a true sheep and a true child of God, is the same pattern as Easter. With Easter we see that there was the cross, Jesus was crucified. Then there was the death, where he died and he was buried and put in the tomb for three days and three nights. And then there is the resurrection. Where Jesus rises from the dead, the tomb is rolled away, and he's alive forevermore. That's the pattern of true conversion. The pattern of a true sheep and a child of God is that they must come face to face with the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. There must be a death where they die to themselves that Christ can live in them. And then there's a resurrection where we are born again from above. And we become children of God by the power of God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's look at that quickly. It's very important. Listen to John 12, 23 to 25. But Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain, much fruit. So in other words, if you think about a grain of wheat, it's a small little thing. It's a small seed. But if it stays in my hand forever, it's always just going to remain what it is. A few years ago, they opened up some of the tombs of the Pharaoh. And inside one of those tombs of the Pharaoh, they found a big pot. And the pot was full of grain. And they took some of that grain and they planted that grain. And that grain grew. It was there for how many thousands of years in that tomb? But it grew and it became a plant. And that plant had many seeds on it. But as long as that little seed, that little grain was in the pot. As long as I hold a seed in my hand, it will always just be what it is. It will always be what it is until the time that it's taken and it goes into the ground. You know what's amazing about a grain of wheat? It's the only grain or seed that actually dies. It it actually dies and it froths. And from its death and frotting comes the new plant comes out of it. Amen? So it's the same with you. As long as you want to do things your way, as long as you want to be in charge of your life, you will always remain what you've always been. But if you get to the place where you die to yourself that Christ might live in you, then when through the baptismal bath, you go through the death of water into newness of life, you lay down your old ways. The minute you die to yourself, you become more than you ever were before. But as long as you will hold on to your life and you be you, you'll always be what you've always been. 
Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. It remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So Jesus was talking about the fact that as long as I remain alive, I will always just be me and I will lead people to God. But Jesus, by dying, by his blood, purchased to God many sons and many daughters. Amen. His blood was the seed for many of us to come to God. So if Jesus remained alive, it wouldn't have happened. But Jesus had to die. He had to fall into the ground and die like a grain of wheat. And then he produced more children for the kingdom of God. And it's the same for you and for me. As long as we remain alive. That's why it carries on. He who loves his life will lose it. But he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Amen. So there's got to be a death to self. So that's why there's a difference between sheep and goats. In a church there's sheep and there's goats. You'll find the sheep. The sheep are those that have gotten honest with the cross of Christ. They come to the cross and they see there Jesus died for my sins. And if they get serious with the cross, then that leads them to repentance. Lord, I repent of my sins because what I did crucified you. Because if I hadn't sinned, you wouldn't have been crucified because you died so that sins might be forgiven so that people could come to God. So a true, a true sheep comes to the cross, comes to repentance, comes to Christ, dies to himself and is born again in you. But a goat comes to church and a goat never repents of his sins. A goat can come here, sit here with you, sing the same songs with you, think he's a good person, and never sees any reason to have to repent. And in church you get goats. Goats that are among sheep. You know what Jesus said in the one parable? He said a man went out into a field one day and he sowed seed. And he left the seed and a few days later, when the seed came up, there were tears amongst the seed. In other words, weeds amongst the nice, proper plants. Amongst the kurang, amongst the corn, there was weeds growing. And the man came to him and said, didn't you plant good seed? No, he said, no, no, I planted good seed. The enemy must have planted tears in between, must have planted weeds in between. And he said, what must I do? Must I pull it out? And he says, no, 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 don't pull it out now because you're going to disturb the good things that are growing. So in other words, I'm not going to chase every, every goat out of the church that I see who's a goat. I'm going to leave them. Because per adventure, God might save their souls and the gospel might be preached to them and they might have a change of heart and they might get serious with the cross and with God and with themselves and be born again from above. Amen? But God himself says that in the church there will be sheep and goats. In the church there's going to be good plants and there's going to be tares. And Jesus himself said what? The same thing that we're seeing here. In the end he shall separate the sheep from the goats. He said, no, no, don't worry. Don't disturb the good things by pulling out the bad things. Leave them. Because in the end... The reapers will go out, which are the angels. And they're going to separate between the good wheat and the tares. And they'll take the wheat and gather them into the barn. In other words, into God's presence. And the weeds they'll gather, put them in bundles, throw them into the fire where they get burnt. Amen? A true child of God, true, true conversion, is that you must face the cross. Let's look at that. Luke nine twenty three to 25 And he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, you guys know this, but I'm getting it through again because make sure that you're a sheep and you're not a goat. Amen? Make sure you're busy with Jesus in honesty and in truth. Don't be busy with religion. Don't be busy with that stuff. Be busy with Jesus. Amen? Jesus says if you want to be a child of God, if you want to be called a proper Christian, then you need to do this. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what is the profit of man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? What profit of a man to gain the whole world but lose his very soul? What profits you to have all the money, all the wealth, all the things, but at the end of this life when you cross over, your soul is lost forever? And what does it profit you? It doesn't profit you at all. But if you want to have what God has for you, then that's the first, that's the first point here. Jesus says, if any man will come after me, desires to follow me, be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Because to serve God is going to cost you something. Amen? Cost me all the people I called friends, but I thank God standing here now. What, what I've received from him is so much greater than the friendship I had there. And I actually saw that those people weren't really my friends. They were just, you know, trying to take advantage and do things themselves. And, you know, I offered up that. But what God gave me in exchange, like I've mentioned before, so much greater. Amen. And then it says that I must deny myself, not my wants, Lord, but your wants. Not my will, your will. Not my life, your life. And then I've got to take up my cross. And this scripture says daily, eh? I've got to take up my cross daily. Because sometimes if you're dealing with somebody at work who's screaming at you, or somebody in the traffic who's swearing at you, there I've got to take up my cross. Do you know that it's a sign of worship when things are going wrong not to lose my temper? Do you know I'm actually worshipping God in that situation 
where somebody is screaming at me and, and, and the old me would have jumped up and given the person a smack. Do you know it's worship now when I keep quiet and I remain patient? Do you know that at that moment I'm worshipping God as much as if I'm in the church and I'm lifting my hands? That to be patient at that moment is worship. To keep quiet at that moment is worship. Listen, I'm carrying a cross because I want to jump up and give him a smack. I want to, but that means I'm carrying my cross because I'm going to be as Christ was. I'm going to die to my old defense mechanisms, my old ways, my old getting angry. Now, it's easy to get angry and you have to justify yourself. Yeah, but, but, but. Sometimes it's different just to be quiet. That means taking up your cross. A sheep takes up his cross, a goat won't. A goat won't. A goat will defend their actions. Yeah, but I was wrong and he was wrong. I, I was right and he was wrong. He skipped the robot. I'm going to get cross with him. I was waiting, you know. Amen. Galatians 2.20. Can you say this? A sheep can say this. It's difficult. There's some days I don't feel like the scripture applies to me. And then I go and pray and I ask God, Lord, please help me. But Paul said this. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. <clears throat> I'd like to just mention the scripture backwards. You know what Paul's saying, what he can say here? Paul is saying, I recognize that Jesus loved me so much and gave himself for me. That everything I do now, I do in remembrance of that. So the life I live in the flesh, I remember that he loved me so much that he laid himself down for me. And because I remember how he laid himself down for me and I live everything in remembrance of that offer that he gave for me who's not worth it, now it's not me that lives and now I, I, I live the way Christ wants me to live. So it's not, no longer I who's in charge but him. And because of that I crucify myself in this world. I am crucified with Christ. Amen? Sometimes I can say it, other days I don't feel like I can say this. Then I have to go back and pray and say, Lord help me to be crucified. You know what's, what a prayer time sometimes is? I just want to explain it this way. When you go into your binnacle and you pray, sometimes your prayer time is when you go down on your knees, you're saying, Lord, I've come here to die again. I've come to die. I've come to be crucified again. My ayavil, ek, ek, me, I. Lord, I've come to be crucified. Lord, I can't sh shout at my wife. I can't lose my temper and fight with her like that. Lord, I crucify myself again. You said I must love my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Lord, I can't do this. I can't, you know, I'm just, the Holy Spirit puts it there. I, I can't lose my temper with, with, with things and with people because I've been crucified to myself that Christ lives through me. And we see Jesus never lost his temper. Jesus only got cross when it was holy anger. And he called people whited sepulchre. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. You know, amen. Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man, this is what a sheep says. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin, but be slaves to righteousness. Amen. Galatians 5.24 Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. A goat won't do that. A goat will say, it's okay if I have a little bit of wine. It's okay if I smoke cigarettes because there's no scripture in the Bible that talks against smoking. You know why? Because smoking wasn't invented back then. Amen. But the Bible does say that, know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and God dwells in you. So I don't want to besoodle, make dirty the temple of God. Amen. I used to smoke. God loosed me because I asked him. Amen. How many of us used to smoke here? Lots of hands. God loosed us. God set us free from it. Amen. Amen. I'm not, I'm not trying to preach that. I'm just trying to say. I crucify that part of myself. I've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. My flesh desired to drink. My flesh desired to smoke. My flesh desired to do all the wrong things. And when I came to Jesus and I got honest with God, and I said, Lord, save me, forgive me, help me. What did I do? I didn't spare those things. I crucified them. I said, Lord, take it out of my life. I'm finished with it. End it. You know what, you know what crucified means? There's one thing that was clear when in Jerusalem the Romans had condemned someone to be crucified, when you saw the man carrying his cross, there's one thing that was evident. That man that was carrying his cross would not come back again. He wasn't coming back the same way he walked. Because the cross did one thing and one thing only. It did a finished work. When anything was nailed to the cross, the cross finished it. 
The cross didn't spare it. The cross was hard. It had no cushions. It was not pretty. Today's Christianity wants to lift up a pretty comfortable cross with a cushion on it and a surround sound and the air conditioning. The cross of Christ is not like that. It's an old, rugged cross. It takes nothing. It gives no- it, it takes everything and it gives nothing. When a man was crucified to the cross, this was certain, that that man would die. So when you come to God and you give your life to Him and you say, Lord, let me be crucified with you, the cross is not going to spare any part of it, eh? So when you get honest with God and you say, Lord, take these things out of my life because I know they grieve you, when you crucify it, it's not coming back. Amen? And it's beautiful. The cross is beautiful because the cross actually looses you from things and it sets you free. Galatians 6.14 But as for me, may I never boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Wow, that's a beautiful scripture, hey? That talks about what crucifixion really is. May I never boast in anything. Say what a good Christian I am. Look how good I am. Look at the gifts God's given me. Look at this I have. And this. May I never boast in anything save the cross of Christ. For had it not been for the cross, had it not been for Calvary, had it not been for Jesus, then forever my soul would have been lost. I would have been never forgiven, never washed with the blood, never filled with the Spirit, never changed. I would have still been terrible and lost and undone. But if I boast, I boast in the cross. Because there where Jesus bled and died for me, my life was changed. Amen? The song, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. Amen? It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I'm happy all the way, because I'm boasting in the cross. Amen? I boast in that, in what He did for me. And then this last bit, through which the world is crucified to me. Amen? The world and all its desires and pleasures has been crucified. All my hope is in Jesus. This world is not my home, I'm passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere else, beyond the blue. Amen? Colossians 2.11 In Him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature with the circumcision performed by Christ and not by human hands. Amen? That sinful nature was cut off of me. It was removed. Not a physical circumcision, but a spiritual one where God took out a heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. It's beautiful, isn't it? After that crucifixion, comes death. Because the cross has its finished work. The cross doesn't play games. Nobody gets down off the cross after they put on it. After the cross comes death. Listen to Romans 6, 3 to 11. As many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into His death. Before I read the rest of the scripture, I have to explain something. When you get baptized in the water, and you say, Lord, I'm giving my life to you now. I want to serve you in spirit and in truth. So I'm going to be baptized according to your word. Your word says, unless a man be born again of the spirit and the water, he shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Lord, I'm going to be baptized according to your word. The baptism is a symbol of laying down my old life and being born again into Christ. When you are baptized into Jesus Christ, you are baptized into his death. Amen. So what happens is this. I was guilty of sin. Sin, disease, and sickness. And the penalty of sin, the wages of it, is death. So in my sinful life, the only thing that I could get from God was judgment and death. And I deserved it. Jesus lived a holy, perfect life. There's no judgment from God against Jesus. Amen? But when Jesus dies on the cross, He takes my sinful nature and He takes my judgment upon Himself. And He there dies as if He sinned, although He didn't. Amen? And when He dies for me, my sins are forgiven. Amen? So this man that was guilty of sin, when I'm baptized into Jesus, there's a trade that happens. I become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because He carried my death. But when I get baptized into Jesus, I'm baptized into His death. He died for sin. And if I've died in Jesus where He carried my sin, I'm I'm dead to all judgment from God. God can't judge me anymore. The enemy can't accuse me anymore. Because the man that used to sin and used to do those things, I'm dead in Christ Jesus. But I'm also alive in Him. I'm dead to the judgment of God and I'm dead to the attacks of the enemy. The person that the devil's looking for, the Joshua he used to know, he's not here anymore. I died in Christ. That old person died in the baptism of waters. It's no longer me that lives, it's Christ that lives in me. I'm a new creation, I'm a brand new man. Old things have passed away, all things have become new in Christ Jesus. Amen? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. 
Amen. For we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection. So if I'm a partaker in his death, like he died for me, I laid down my old life for him. And then in the same way, like he rose from the dead, I rise into newness of life with him. Amen. Certainly we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So if I'm dead in Jesus, I'm free from sin. Amen. Sin has no dominion over me. Sin only has power over somebody who's alive. But I'm dead in Christ Jesus, so it has no power over me. Amen. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Beautiful, eh? Hey? So if you baptized, you're dead to sin, but alive to God. Amen? And then you lean on the Holy Spirit who helps you to do it. Like the song says, learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. I'm finding more power than I've ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. Amen? Colossians 3, 1 to 5. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above and not on the things on the earth. For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. So that's another part. I'm dead to the person I used to be. The sins are no longer remembered. And I'm hidden in God with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You put to death those things because it's, it's of another nature. Amen? And you're not that person anymore. And then the last part we have is resurrection. So I come to the cross, I get honest there, I crucify myself, I lay myself down so that I can have what Jesus has for me. Then I become a partaker in his death. So I'm dead to sin and trespasses, I'm dead to any temptation, I'm dead, I'm a new man in Christ Jesus. And then I rise again. Colossians 2, 12 to 13. This is spiritual I'm talking about. You need to see it with a spiritual eye. Buried with him in baptism, that's with the water. In which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision in your flesh. So in other words, you were dead in that stuff. He has made you alive now together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. That's the exchange that took place. He took my penalty so that I can have his life. Amen. He took my sin upon him so that God put the punishment on him so I don't have to have that punishment. Amen. So if I'm dead to sin with him, then I'm, I'm alive with him, having my sins forgiven. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, I said this already, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When Jesus died, there was a certain body that was laid down. But when the Holy Spirit came, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus was brought back to life. And Jesus rose from the dead. The Jesus that rose from the dead was different. The Jesus that rose from the dead walked through walls. The Jesus that rose from the dead looked one way, and then he looked another way. Amen? The Jesus that rose from the dead, he, he sowed one body, but in the Spirit was raised another. If you think about a seed, when you plant a seed, it looks like one thing. But when it raises up, it looks like a different thing. The tree looks different. I sow this mortal body, but Christ raises a spiritual one. Amen? It's beautiful, isn't it? We've become new in Jesus. Galatians 6, 15. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. Paul's talking about the physical circumcision here. Because the Jewish people were saying, you have to be circumcised. And Paul's saying to them, circumcision doesn't matter. He says, what counts is a new creation. He's saying, have you gone to the cross? Have you died? And have you been risen anew in Christ? Because whether you physically circumcised or not means nothing. What matters is, have you come to the cross, have you died, and have you risen again from the dead? That's what Paul was saying, a new creation. And that's what God promises to make us. God promises to make us a new creation. Amen? It's a beautiful thing. Who we were supposed to be is who God makes us. Before Adam fell, that was God's plan for mankind. And after Adam falls, then sin comes into the world. But through what Jesus did for us, we become what Adam should have been. And we become like he was supposed to be. 
spiritually alive. And all of that comes back to us again. Ephesians 4.24 And to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We're actually supposed to put on the new self and walk in that. Walk in what the blood of Jesus did for you. Walk in what the Holy Spirit does for you when the Holy Spirit renews you. There's a new you and a new self. Sometimes when you're saved and you're born again and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you come to serve God for the first time, then what happens is you've been born again, you, you knew, you spiritually you transformed. There's a new you. The old you died in, in the baptism. The old you's passed away when the Holy Spirit regenerated you. You've crucified those things. But sometimes we have a habitual way of thinking. So now I still think like the old man used to. And that's why the Bible says renew your mind with the word of God, with the washing of the word. So sometimes we, we're a new creation, but we haven't realized that God has made us a new creation. And we've got to learn to walk as that new creation. So don't think like you used to. If you have, some people used to swear a lot. Ask God for, for deliverance from swearing. And then you don't think it's possible because you're used to talking like that. Just give it long enough. Ask God long enough. And you'll see how God takes away that old you and you put on the new self. How God cleans your language, cleans your mind, cleans your ways. Amen. And you and I must actively put that on. So a lot of the times you must tell yourself, hey, but I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I don't do the things I used to do. I'm a brand new man. Old things have passed away. I don't lose my temper like that anymore. I don't talk like that anymore. No, I don't steal anymore. I don't do these things anymore. Amen? The truth. 2 Timothy 2.11 this, say, this saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with Him, we shall also live with Him. Amen? I'm not just a sinner saved by grace. Although I am. But right now, I'm not just a sinner saved by grace. Right now, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Do you see, do you see yourself that way? A lot of the times, we as Christians live in this place where, Ach, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You're not just a sinner saved by grace. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus by faith. Amen? Walk like that. Think like that. I'm not talking about being prideful. I'm talking about understanding who you are in Christ Jesus. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. I've put on Christ. I've taken off the old things. Because if I died with Him, then I also live with Him. And if I live with Him and He lives with me, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You see how important it is. There's sheep and there's goats. Pastor Dani used to tell a story about sheep and goats at the slaches, at the, at, the, at the abattoirs, at the butcheries. He said that there's a little, little goat there, and they used to get the goat, and the goat used to lead the sheep into the, into the um, drukhang, into the place where the sheep get put into a, a funnel, and then they get led, and right there they get, they, get, um, they get slaughtered. And the sheep get turned into lamb that we like to enjoy. But the little goat would lead the sheep through this path, and right before they're gonna, and the, right before they're gonna get to the place where they're gonna go into the abattoir, the little goat jumps out, and then the sheep go through, and the goat leads them into slaughter the whole time, and then the goat jumps out, and the goat jumps out. That's a goat's nature. A goat will lead people down the wrong road. A goat won't worry, and just before the problem, it'll jump out. You and I are not goats. We're not pretending to be anything. We're not pretending to be this. We're not busy with religion. You and I are sheep. That's why David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why? Because David's a sheep. Amen? You and I are sheep because follow that pattern, the pattern of Easter. Go through it in your heart. Sometimes remind yourself month to month, year to year. Say, Lord, I want to remain a sheep. I don't want to be changed into a goat. Lord, I want to stay your servant. I don't want to be busy with religion and church and this and that. I, want to be really, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to be busy with religion and church. I want to be busy with the living God. I want to be busy with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to serve you in spirit and in truth, Lord. I want to have a personal relationship with you. Then you follow that pattern of Easter. Lord, am I still carrying my cross daily? Am I still crucifying myself? Lord, am I still dying? You know what Paul says in another scripture? He says, I die daily. Paul says those words, I die daily. Amen. Are you still dying to yourself daily? Because if you will crucify and die to the flesh, then you who have died with him will be risen with him. You'll walk in the spirit and in truth. Put on the new man. In the likeness of Christ. And you'll be a sheep. Because at the end of it all. What does the Bible say? He shall appear on the throne of his glory. And all the nations shall be gathered before him. And he himself shall separate between the sheep and the goats. And those on his right hand he'll say. Enter into the rest prepared for you by my father before the foundation of the earth. And those on the left he'll say. Depart from me you workers of iniquity. For I never knew you. And the Bible says there will be great gnashing of teeth and weeping. Amen. This is truth. 
that I want to be on the right hand side. I want to be on the right side. There's nothing greater for me than one day to hear the Lord Jesus Christ say to me, Enter into my rest, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. Let me appoint you over a much. Amen. We can stand and we can close in prayer. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your love and for your kindness. Lord, unfortunately in the church at this time, there are sheep and there are goats. Lord, I pray for every goat, Lord, that your word would find ingang tot in I seal. And that you would change that person's heart, that they would come to love you and serve you in spirit and in truth. Born again from above, crucified, dead, and risen with Jesus. And Heavenly Father, Lord, we who are sheep, Lord, that you would continue to lead us and guide us. For Lord, you are our shepherd, and we are the sheep. That, Lord, you would lead us and guide us by still waters. That you'd make us to lie down in green pastures. That you'd prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. That you'd anoint our head with oil and that our cup with, would run over. And that, Lord, we might dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, we ask that, for you are our shepherd and we are your sheep. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you for your services this this. Uh, this day, this morning, this evening, we thank you for your anointing. We thank you for the musicians. We thank you for your love and for your kindness. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Lord, we confess it tonight. We love you, and we thank you for what you've done for us. And Lord, we've made that confession. We make it again tonight. Lord, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. We love you, Lord. We will serve you. Lord, we'll take up our cross. We'll follow you. We just ask you to take us by the hand and help us. And lead us and guide us, Lord. If you will lead us, we will follow. And we'll know, Lord, that you'll present us before the Father, clothed in glory, spotless. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a nice evening.